Okay, so welcome everyone to the second week of lectures. Um, just as a reminder for the people online, um, we have the Q&A feature enabled on the Zoom call. So if you have a question, um, type something into the question and answer thing, and then we'll have moderators here who will either ask the question or if it's a longer one, they might ask you to unmute and ask it. Um, and then again, at the end of the lecture, we'll have time for longer discussions, uh, just as we've been uh, doing for the, the first three lectures. Okay. Um, okay, yeah, so we'll get started. So the second week, so we're going to be doing three lectures this week as well. Um, and we're now going to be moving the focus on to how you implement some of these algebraic cons considerations into the gravitational description of the theory. Um, and so the an important thing that we'll be discussing today is kind of the central way that the, the gravity description comes about is through constraints that show up because of gravity is a gauge theory. Uh, and so we're going to be dis discussing how the constraints show up in the classical theory, and then we'll move on probably in the next lecture to implementing them in the quantum theory and how that it leads to interesting algebras and generalized entropies and all of that good stuff. Okay, so to start out with, um, I just wanted to, I wrote up here a few things about how you should think about uh, why constraints are showing up in gravity. So um, in gravity, um, it's known to be what is a diffeomorphism invariant theory. So the theory is invariant under arbitrary reparameterizations of coordinates. Um, and diffeomorphisms are a gauge symmetry in gravity. So what that means is sort of, it's sort of a redundancy in the description. Um, one way to think about what gauge symmetry is, is you can think of it as a tension between a purely local description, which has been important in our discussion so far. We've been focusing very much on local subregions and algebras that are local. Um, and on the one hand, and then a non-redundant description on the other hand. So in order to... Uh, recover some amount of locality in a theory that has gauge symmetry, you generally introduce redundancies in the description. Um, and so the there are in the local description, there are non-physical degrees of freedom. Um, so in any local description, there's going to be these non-physical degrees of freedom. And what that means is that the gauge transformations will act on some of the sort of kinematical local degrees of freedom that you uh, that you described. Um, and the constraints, you can think of them as the things that generate the action of this gauge symmetry on this local description. And so ultimately, if you're looking for the physical algebra of observables, you need to do something in order to eliminate this redundancy that you've introduced. And so you generally use the constraints as something that you need to find operators that commute with them. And solving this issue of, uh, so the gauge invariant operators are the ones that will commute with the constraints. And um, solving that is how you get, you know, an algebra of, say, diff invariant observables. Okay, so that's the general uh, structure of why constraints are showing up. And so then I want to go ahead and discuss how you see this in detail and what you do in order to implement this procedure of finding things that commute with the constraints. <clears throat> Okay, so the first thing we want to discuss is essentially how this shows up in the classical theory, because a lot of what we're doing, uh, we'll be working on semi-classical gravity, and a lot of the structure carries directly over from how uh, constraints operate in the classical theory. So constraints in classical gravity. Okay, so um, essentially the, the way constraints show up is you generally do some sort of phase space construction. Um, in the classical theory, you'll do a, a phase space construction and you see that constraints are generators of gauge transformations and you have to do something in order to get a physical phase space by implementing the constraints. Um, so I just wanted to remind you how there's kind of a straightforward way to see that constraints arise whenever you have gauge symmetry. So just to, to uh, for definitiveness, we're going to be doing gravity 
Um, and so we'll start with some Lagrangian. The Lagrangian consists of a gravitational piece plus a matter piece. And so the gravitational part of the Lagrangian is the usual Einstein Hilbert term, say with possible con cosmological constant. Um, I'm going to be using this notation where Lagrangians are differential forms of, of maximal degree. So it's something you can integrate over an open region in space time if you're constructing the action. So this epsilon here is just like a volume form in space time. And then this matter Lagrangian. So, so our dynamical fields phi are going to consist of the metric and some matter fields. We'll call them psi. So this matter Lagrangian is just whatever action you have for the matter fields. Um, yeah, and we'll we'll assume a minimal coupling between the matter fields and the gravitational fields. And just as a reminder, when you bury the total Lagrangian, this is how you get the equations of motions that I'll just write E phi dot delta phi. These are matter and uh, gravitational equations of motion plus a boundary term that depends on phi and delta phi. This boundary term um, is the thing that you use when constructing a phase space. So you will, however, your favorite way of doing the phase space, you can do these covariant phase space methods, or you can do something like ADM. The, the boundary term that comes up when you vary the action is always something that you'll use to construct the symplectic form. Okay, so the fact that diffeomorphisms are a symmetry of this Lagrangian means uh, that you can get another occurrence associated with a general symmetry. So reminder that um, diffeomorphisms are generated by vector fields and they act, act on your dynamical fields by this Lie derivative, Lie derivative of phi. So that accounts for how the fields change. Um, as you move to different space-time points, but then it also accounts for if there's, you know, tensor indices on that, it accounts for the change in coordinates on the tensor indices as well. And so given any diffio, since it's a symmetry of this action, you can find another current that we call Jc, and it's equal to, you can construct it explicitly in terms of this symplectic potential theta, where you evaluate it on the transformation of the field and since there's a boundary term, when you vary the action under this, um, you get this extra contribution from the Lagrangian as well. So Noether's theorem says that because the fields are asymmetry, um, so this is a D minus one form, so a current, you can either think of it as like a vector density or a D minus one form. So this is something you integrate over co-dimension one surfaces to get uh, charges. And Noether's theorem says that this is conserved on shell. So it's equal to minus E dot leak C phi. So when the equations of motions are satisfied, this is zero. Okay, so this is known as Noether's first theorem. This is true anytime you have a symmetry of an action. Um, the thing that we're interested in is actually a generalization that comes from the fact that C is arbitrary in this equation. So it's a local symmetry. I can rescale it by an arbitrary local function of space time. And because of that, I can look at this right hand side and uniquely decompose it into a term that involves derivatives of C and a term that doesn't involve derivatives of C. So there's a unique decomposition where I can write this. So this involves at most one derivative of C on this side. I can write it as the derivative of some combination of equation of motions plus an extra term and both n and c in this equation depend algebraically on the vector c okay so what do you get out of doing this well because this equation holds identically that means off shell um i could you know re i could take a compactly supported c and integrate this equation over a region that contains the support of C. And I would find this term on this side would just integrate to zero, and this term would integrate to zero, which means that this thing has to hold identically and has to be zero. So the second theorem, another second theorem involves the this 
this type of statement that there's, when you have local symmetries, there are things that have to hold identically. So what this argument means that, that this NC, which is a combination of the equations of motions and its derivatives, is identically zero. So what is this kind of uh, object? These are called like the, these are called the other identities. And these are things like in GR, um, if you just had this Einstein Hilbert Lagrangian, this identity is something like the contracted Bianchi identity. So this is del A G A B equals zero for just GR. So pure. For the matter terms, there's there's things like the derivative of the matter stress tensor is related to matter equations of motion. Okay, so this is identically zero, which means that. So then, what is this other term? Um, this other term is a combination of equations of motion, and this C C is what is known as the constraints in the theory. So they're equations of motions, and you can essentially argue from these other identities that they're constraints because. Uh, Essentially, the other identities tell you that these equations of motion depend, depend on fewer time derivatives than the other equations of motion in the theory. So if you're doing an initial value formulation, these are constraints on the initial data, not dynamical equations. Okay. So this is a general procedure for given a Lagrangian, you use this formula in order to identify what the constraints of the theory are. Um, it also tells you that the another current is essentially equal to the constraints up to possible boundary terms. So because this n vanishes identically, you conclude that the another current has to equal the constraints up to an exact term. And so this is sometimes called the another potential. And uh, these boundary terms are the things that give you the physical Hamiltonians um, in the theory. Here we should switch the, uh, yeah, it's, so again, so the, the, the another current generating the, the transformation of C is given by constraints up to boundary terms. So what this means is, um, so I, I guess I won't go into detail about the, the way you construct a phase space, but essentially you can use your favorite technique for constructing a dynamical phase space in gravity. The thing that you need is a symplectic form, which you th generally think of that as an integral over a complete Cauchy surface of some symplectic uh, current. <clears throat> and this thing you would construct, say, from theta up to possible plus boundary terms. And so uh, the thing that the other current does is it tells you how to generate, it not only is a conserved current, it actually generates the transformation of the, the vector field there. So you can write a Hamiltonian for the transformation C, which I'll put, I'll put a little G that said, this means it's the complete gravitational Hamiltonian. Um, write it as an integral of this other current over a complete Cauchy surface which according to this equation, um, so up to, again, boundary terms. Up to boundary terms of something, which I won't write because we actually want to write, use this equation to see that the Hamiltonian is the integral of the constraints over the bulk piece plus a boundary term, which we'll call B C. So this B involves this another potential plus additional terms that come from basically boundary terms that you add into the complete action. And the reason this is called a Hamiltonian is that it satisfies Hamilton's equations for this transformation uh, that C generates. So the variation of this Hamiltonian, where this variation is the variation coming from in, induced by the varying the dynamical fields. Um, this is equal to this symplectic form evaluated on the transformation leak C phi, which is the, the, the Diffio transformation. Um, 
plus equation of motions. So integral over C, uh, over the Cauchy surface of equations of motion. Okay, so this is Hamilton's equations of motion that the variation of the Hamiltonian equaling the symplectic form evaluated on the transformation is equivalent to setting the equations of motion to zero. So why do you have the G superscript on H? It just, yeah, it's okay. This is my notation for the full gravitational Hamiltonian. So this is gravity plus matter. And so G is, yeah, the full gravitational. It's, yeah, just a notation I've used. To. It just seems opposite. If it's full, why put a G? I don't know. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so remember just, this is gonna be gravity plus matter. Um, yeah. Okay, and so on, this implies the Poisson bracket relation that H is the generator of this uh, transformation. So on a generic matter or gravitational field, this HCG implements, when you take its Poisson bracket, the lead, it implements the transformation generated by C. So the gauge symmetries in this setup are actually the compactly supported ones. So the things that uh, the constraints themselves are generating are those transformations where this vector field dies off at the boundary of a Cauchy surface. Okay, let me just draw. You have some sort of Cauchy surface sigma and it goes out to some sort of asymptotic boundary, which you should think of as living at infinity. Um, and so the boundary terms you get from the, the pieces at infinity and so when C is compactly supported, so it's not moving the, the portion of the boundary at infinity, that's a pure gauge transformation. And those are the things that are generated just by the constraints themselves. This equation also allows for actual, you know, real time evolution. And those are related to asymptotic symmetry vectors that are acting at infinity. And, you know, that's the statement that this boundary term will generate the actual time translation when you implement the constraints. <clears throat> okay. Okay, so what do these constraints look like in gravity? Um, so like I said, these are just combinations of the equations of motion. So this sees the, the constraint equation will look like something, okay, that you have these volume form terms and factors of G Newton, but they are just components of the Einstein equation. So GAB plus lambda delta AB minus T matter AB. Okay, the whole thing dotted into C. And then, okay, depending on the theory, there are additional possible terms involving the matter equations of motion as well. It's a little annoying to write them out in detail, so just remember, these show up if you have a vector or tensor matter, you have these extra terms that show up in the constraints. You just determine them by that relation I wrote earlier um, on the board. Okay, so did you define what epsilon a is? Yeah, I said it in words. This is just, oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah, so um, I'll often use this notation. So epsilon is a volume form. And so epsilon, sometimes if I need to contract something into say the first index of the volume form, I'll leave all of the other indices implicit. So epsilon a is just showing you the first index of the volume form, and then all of the other ones are implicit. So this is now a D minus one form because I've contracted one of the indices there. Yeah, thanks for the question there. Okay, so it's a, the one thing that's worth mentioning is that you see the stress tensor for the matter fields show up explicitly in these constraints. <clears throat> Okay, so one thing that we'll be talking about when we're dealing with local subregions in gravity is that um, 
there's it's a bit of a thorny topic when you're trying to define sort of where a subregion is in gravity because you know generic diffeomorphisms can tend to move a region around. Um, this is going to show up in the construction of our gravitational algebras, and it's a problem that we have to deal with in order to uh, avoid getting sort of nothing in the limit where we, you know, implement the constraints appropriately. The way we're going to deal with this is assume that there's some additional fields besides these dynamical matter fields that sort of define a background where, with respect to which you can define a subregion. So effectively, this is uh, the introduction of what we'll call an observer degree of freedom. So, <clears throat> in quotes, it's going to be some dynamical thing that we're able to construct, uh, sort of define where the subregion is located relative to. So um, what is this observer degree of freedom? It's, we're not going to be incredibly explicit about it. It's just something that you need. You can think of it as a localized clump of sort of decoupled matter. You want it to be effectively um, independent of the matter degrees of freedom. You should think of it as being not entangled with the, the local quantum fields. Um, and it's something that you can then use as sort of a heavy point-like particle, say, or sort of distributed uh, clump of matter, which you can define um, operators relative to. The important feature that it has to have is that A is decoupled to first approximation from the matter and the graviton degrees of freedom. On the other hand, um, it needs to couple universally to gravity via its stress tensor. So it needs to have a stress tensor that shows up in the constraints um, and so it defines essentially a notion of time translation for a subregion that you're talking about. So what that means is that we want to be able to define a Hamiltonian for this extra matter that we're going to be dressing to and write it as an integral over sigma s. So some subregion, we'll call this sigma s. We want it to be localized in space time. And it's this Hamiltonian needs to look contribute just like the matter does in the constraint. PAB, CB, again, we'll do epsilon A, that's just the volume form in space time. <clears throat> okay, so when you couple this to the, the rest of the theory, this should show up as an extra term in this constraint here. Um, and then it allows you to write the form of the constraints in general. So in particular, we're going to, going to be interested in constraints that look essentially like this boost transformation. So, so say we've defined, we were interested in this subregion that's the causal development of this partial Cauchy surface sigma. And then we're going to be interested in implementing constraints that are related to this boost transformation. So this, this flow that I've written is a, a boost-like vector field. It's the thing that we discussed in the previous lectures that vanishes at the boundary of a subregion and generates this boost. Um, and the constraint for this is that you just integrate this quantity over the complete Cauchy surface here. And then using these equations for uh, the relation between the, the constraint and the, um, the total gravitational Hamiltonian, we can write the constraint operator that this, uh, that this transformation is generating. So this constraint operator is the integral of over the Cauchy surface of the total constraint. Um, it's going to equal this contribution of say matter and gravity, um, it's going to receive a contribution from the local observer in this region, which is just added on top of this. And then this boundary term shows up. And this boundary term is the thing on shell that is equal to the, the Hamiltonian generating time translation. So if we take this vector field to approach an asymptotic time translation at infinity, 
Um, note that it's pointing backwards at infinity. So if you work out that the thing it's generating is minus the ADM Hamiltonian. And so if you put it on the correct side for what this constraint thing is, uh, you'll work out the signs demand that in the constraint, it comes with a plus sign. So it's plus the H ADM Hamiltonian. And again, that is this, this boundary term um, that shows up in this constraint equation. <clears throat> um, okay, so this is going to be a, a crucial operator that we're going to be working with when we implement this. So again, it's equal to this HCG, which generates the transformation of C that from this vector field flow on the, the matter and gravity fields. It has a decoupled observer Hamiltonian that's an extra contribution to the stress tensor here. And then there's a boundary term at infinity. So when this thing is zero, it'll say something like the ADM Hamiltonian agrees with the thing generating the transformation in the bulk. <clears throat> okay, just to point out a generalization of this as well, um, let me just do a new board for this. What I've described is the setup where we have a local subregion um, associated with this, sig this partial Cauchy surface sigma s, but then an asymptotic boundary. Um, it's also of interest to think about what happens in closed universes. This was the case considered in the original CLPW paper for De Sitter space. So in that case, you can take your Cauchy surface to be so the complete Cauchy surface is something like a closed, you know, sphere of sorts. And then you're going to divide this into two pieces. So you would have a subregion here and the complementary region. And this vector field is this boost-like thing that generates forward time evolution in the one region and backwards time evolution in the complementary region. Here. Good. Um, and so just to say what you do in this setup, you generally need to include this semi-classical observer degree of freedom, one for the subregion to define you know, things that you're dressing relative to in sigma sub s, and you need to include a, an additional observer degree of freedom in the complementary region. So you'll dress operators in the complementary region to a complementary observer. In this setup, the ADM, Hamiltonian and the asymptotic boundary uh, played the role of this complementary observer. In the closed universe, you want to introduce explicitly the second observer, um, which we'll call um, observer prime. So a couple of questions. Oh, yeah. Is it a good time to stop? Um, maybe I can just write down the last thing and then we'll, yeah, it'll be a good time to just go through questions. So this, because the thing's pointing in the back and, and is past corrected here, the observer prime, you want to define the Hamiltonian to be positive, so we'll flip the sign here. So there was a minus sign there, it's going to be plus here. TAB, observer prime, CB, epsilon A. And so in this setup, this the analog of this constraint is going to be uh, write it in the same order. It's again going to be the stuff generating. Uh, evolution on the matter fields plus the observer and then minus the observer prime Hamiltonian. So there's this, this minus sign that kind of plays a role in this setup. And we'll see in later lectures that these signs can be important when you're determining what types of algebras you have. So that's something we'll come back to at a later point. So yeah, now is a good time for uh, questions on the, the general setup. Yeah. Okay, so one question is, um, is this a local or an integrated expression? I mean, can it be made local? I think it's talking about- The constraint? The, yeah, actually maybe, um, let me click cancer live so you can ask it particularly. Look at, can you uh, unmute and ask, clarify your question? Yeah, can you, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. 
Oh, hello. Hi. Uh, uh, I have a question. Yeah, it's, it's about... <laughs> Good, thanks. It's about the constraints. Can it be made uh, local, that expression? Because I'm confused about the uh, Sigma S construction you made. So if, if I am local and I'm outside Sigma S, then H observer does not contribute? Is that how should I interpret what you did? Yeah, so, well, yeah, this is a good thing to to clarify what, what which constraint this is, because we're going to be talking about local versus global constraints. So I don't know if they can see this expression here, but if, is it possible to move to this board? Uh, yeah. Okay, yeah. So you should think of this as this global constraint, which is integrated over the complete Cauchy surface, and it involves the contributions at infinity. Um, we're going to, so this is the thing we'll use with constructing the algebras. We'll say we need this constraint. You, we need things that commute with this global constraint that involves the complete integral over the Cauchy surface. Um, towards the end of the lecture, we should have time to talk about how you would split this into a sum of two local pieces. Um, that splitting will be useful at the end of the day converting sort of well-defined entropies that we compute into uh, generalized entropies, which are sums of individually divergent terms. So there's, towards the end of the lecture, we'll talk about what happens when you split this into this local constraint on this region and plus a local constraint, constraint on the complementary region. It's just that splitting um, leads to certain UV divergences. But the fact that the, the split constraints, so even, you know, this thing, it might be a bit UV divergent. On the other hand, constraints are supposed to be zero. So it's sort of making sure that the local constraints hold as well, which it should just be zero regardless of divergences, um, gives an explanation for why certain terms, even though they're individually divergent, that their divergences agree. It's because the things like the local constraints are actually zero and it matches divergences. So hopefully that answered the question, but yeah, thanks for pointing out that it's, it's important that this is the global constraint on the, the total Cauchy surface. The second question, is it possible to write the field CA, the vector field explicitly, is it C infinity? Oh, um, is it a smooth vector field? I, I guess, guess that's the question. Like, what class of vector fields are you considering? I guess is the question. Yeah, I think we do want it to be a smooth vector field. Um, why smooth? Yeah, why? By smooth, you mean infinitely differentiable? <laughs> yeah, so I don't know exactly. When you talk about the diffeomorphism group of the of a manifold, I think you're usually thinking in terms of the smooth diffeomorphisms. Um, some of those details, the, these, these diffeomorphism groups are actually quite complicated. And so they have very strange properties, but often you are, in, you know, the, the ones that are, you know, differentiable up to a certain point have some things that are better behaved than the smooth ones. On the other hand, they have weird properties as well. So I think often there are technical advantages to making sure that the vector field is smooth. Uh, so, okay. yeah, um, explicitly, I'm not going to write it down because I don't have an explicit coordinate system, but it's something where, you know, it's going to be vanishing linearly near here. And again, there was this constraint that, that, you know, it vanishes at the entangling surface here. First derivative is proportional to the binormal. That means that the flow is preserving the light cones in the vicinity of the entangling surface. And I have a question, one more. I just keep asking this, and I maybe I'll never stop until I pass away. But <laughs> this role of the observer, which you said was to uh, like give a background to define the region that we're even referring to. Yeah. Another way you would think you could define that region is by defining its boundary, um, mm -hmm. and namely, you know, the surface that you call the entangling surface. So, I mean. I don't know if you'll ever get to this, but could you say just a word now about whether or not it would be feasible to forego introduction of the observer or, or to locate the observer on the boundary, basically? Oh, so locating it on the boundary. Yeah, so I mean, this is a good question. It's probably something that's worth looking into. I would say the whole, 
whole set of questions in this line of research is what you should actually take for this observer to be. We're going to take something that seems to give sensible results and it's sort of motivated by this dressing picture. You could ask it something that Ted was suggesting is somehow that can you just use the boundary surface um, and dress with respect to that, say you've determined that dynamically. So it's a good set of questions. So one thing you always have to be thinking about is that things like the area operator in standard treatments um, is a bit is a UV divergent thing. Um, and so you will at some point have to address this issue that the, the actual thing you say you would want to replace this observer by something like the area operator, you have to come up with a separate way to understand that you've actually regulated that in a good way and um, can still see the cancellation of divergences with some other things. Which are, the thing that that divergence is going to cancel against is this one-sided um, stress tensor. So you integrate the stress tensor with a not smooth vector field. So it's something that's like zero here and then has a kink and starts going like that. So that's the thing that is a bit divergent. So yeah, there are a set of questions as how you would do that. And so there may be a way to do that. We can maybe discuss more towards the end if people are interested in ideas for that. But yeah, certainly it just the general question that's worth something that definitely deserves more treatment is what exactly is this observer degree of freedom? Okay, thank you. Okay, so I have all for questions. Okay, so the next thing I want to talk about is um, the perturbative uh, expansion of constraints. <clears throat> okay, so this is an important topic because this sets the context of uh, what sort of quantum gravity we're actually trying to get at. And it's important that in this setup, we need to be working in a description where quantum field theory and curved space-time is a good first approximation to what we're doing. And that comes about in the G-Newton to zero limit limit of quantum gravity. So G-Newton um, is essentially a coupling constant in gravity. You're taking a limit where the gravitational interactions are weakly, you know, are suppressed. And so we're going to take a limit where actually the gravitons themselves are going to decouple. This is sort of a standard way to do perturbative quantization of uh, just gravitons in general. So the way you do this is you take your, arbit your metric that's defined arbitrarily and you want to expand it around a background metric, which you take as a C number. So this is fixed. Plus, I'm going to write this funny look kappa cap like this. Um, yeah, plus the so plus a perturbation that's proportional to this uh, other kappa. I'm just writing it in a funny way so that it's different from the surface gravity. And so this uh, curly kappa is equal to square root of 32 pi g newton. Um, and you use this normalization so that when you do the quadratic order expansion of the, the Lagrangian, so the einstein hilbert Lagrangian expanded to quadratic order, just has a canonical kinetic term for H. So it has the standard, um, the G is not out in front, it just has H dot squared. Okay, so what you do is you look at the Lagrangian to second order um, in terms of the gravitons, that's going to be decoupled from everything else. And then you have the matter Lagrangian, which at this order is just going to couple to the background metric AB. So this perturbative expansion, then what happens is we have to be careful about what happens to the gauge symmetries in this expansion because you need to scale the gauge transformations in order to preserve the form of the metric. Okay. 
So in order to preserve this decomposition where you have kappa, um, the metric is a small perturbation of the background, you have to rescale the gauge transformations to be order kappa as well. Okay, so delta of this rescaled GAV is still going to be just given by, so it's, it's this kappa leaks the of GAV. This is just the ordinary gauge transformation. And you can expand this out in terms of the lead derivative of the background metric plus um, a kappa squared term of the metric perturbation. <clears throat> and similarly, delta of the matter field psi is going to equal, um, yeah, it's going to be suppressed by a power of kappa lead C of psi. So what happens is that we're now interested in the kappa goes to zero limit of these transformations. Um, so anything that whose transformation is order kappa, so these two will be are the ones that are going to be suppressed in the limit. So this one will just go to zero as this kappa goes to zero. And if you work out, you know, look at both sides of this equation and expand it out in terms of the background metric, which is not varied, and the perturbation, you'll see that delta, this kappa C of the graviton, so the metric perturbation here, has an unsuppressed piece in this limit in terms of the lead derivative of the background metric. And then it has the standard transformation like on any other matter field where it has a suppressed piece and then the lead derivative of the matter, uh, the graviton piece. So again, in the kappa goes to zero limit, this term will drop out and this term will drop out. And what remains here, this is Catholic C, is the set of linearized diffeomorphisms, which are just C acting on the on the background metric. And so these are just going to be an abelian gauge transformation for the, the graviton degree of Rio. So now we want to use this and expand out this Poisson bracket relation um, where we have this equation that um, for an arbitrary field phi and you for the in the nonlinear theory, the Poisson bracket of H of the G and matter is equal to leak C phi. And then we want to expand this out where this uh, gravitational Hamiltonian Um, expand it out in, in powers of kappa as well. So you have this kappa to the minus two keys, which is just the background value. Did I write it as zero? Yeah. Then it's going to have a term that's kappa to the minus one. We'll call it one. And then a kappa to the, the zero piece, HC2. So again, the, the Hamiltonian just comes with an overall factor of one over G Newton out in front. So that's why the background value is kappa to the minus two. Um, this kappa to the minus one term is linear in the metric perturbation and it doesn't involve the matter fields at all. At all. And then this term is quadratic in metric perturbations and involves the stress tensor of the matter fields here. <clears throat> <clears throat> so then what you do is you plug in this expansion order by order in kappa you uh, into this Poisson bracket relation um, up here and match terms order by order in kappa and so what do you find at the end of the day you're going to get um, say if you want the Poisson bracket of the HAB field with say this H1, C, there, you'll find that this has this Poisson bracket relation that it's equal to just the linearized diffeomorphism part. So 
So the linearized part of the gravitational Hamiltonian is the generator of the linearized gauge transformation. Um, when you work out what the second order piece is, so this is the piece that's quadratic in the H fields, this will generate the transformation of HAB, so the Lie derivative of the actual graviton field here. And similarly, for the matter fields, psi, they don't transform, oops, okay. They don't transform under these linearized diffeomorphisms. You'd find H1 equals zero. And then the psi matter with HC2 is going to equal the derivative of psi. So this HC2 has again both the, the graviton piece so and a matter piece. And you should think of this as the stress tensor. Essentially, this is this this the piece that couples to the, the matter fields really is the stress tensor of your matter fields. And so expanding out this constraint or this Poisson bracket relation in the gravitational theory in this G Newton to zero limit recovers the statement that the stress tensor really is the generator of diffeomorphisms in the, the non-gravitational theory. So this is a statement that will hold in a theory that really you've turned off gravity entirely. You just get a flow that the stress tensor is generating on your quantum field side, which are like the fields in a fixed background. And so similarly, you see the quadratic piece um, of the, the Hamiltonian here. So you should think of this as kind of a graviton stress tensor, and it's also implementing the transformation of a diffeomorphism on the gravitons. Okay, so yeah, I was gonna just, so, okay, yeah. So what is the point? The point is um, that the higher order terms, um, essentially, when you're doing this constraint, there's this H2 will show up in the perturbative expansion of the constraint. And you see that there's stuff in the constraint that's actually generating a transformation on the linearized theory. So this transformation will only be gauged when you actually go to interacting order in kappa. But in the kappa goes to zero limit, you see there's a residual transformation of this second order piece on the dynamical fields. Um, the other point is that these, we had this observer Hamiltonian and an ADM Hamiltonian. And the way to think of these as observables in this linearized theory is that they're completely unconstrained in this limit that kappa goes to zero. They basically don't show up in these types of Poisson bracket relations. Um, and so in the linearized theory, you just treat this as a completely decoupled thing. This ADM Hamiltonian is something that you integrate at infinity. It's something that you can add by hand. Um, on the other hand, when you go to interacting order, this constraint will relate this observer in ADM Hamiltonian um, to the value of the stress tensor in the yeah, to the value of the stress tensor of these matter fields here. Um, and so basically there's situations where if you don't match the ADM Hamiltonian to this linearized stress tensor in the linearized theory, those will be examples of solutions that don't actually list, lift to solutions in the interacting theory. So once you go to the interacting theory, there's gonna be a relation between the ADM observer Hamiltonian and this quadratic order stress tensor. And so the idea is you should constrain the linearized theory where these guys are completely decoupled with the, the constraint that's gonna come from the interacting theory. Um, and so what is that constraint? It's the constraints will now say that you should make sure to in, implement that the second order transformation uh, matches, it's the, the interacting piece of the constraint. It looks the same as before, but you want to implement that these uh, operate, so this constraint is implemented on the linearized theory. So instead of the full 
uh, gravit or the full Hamiltonian here, we just have this second order piece that involves the stress tensor. <clears throat> and yeah, so the philosophy is to implement this where these guys are quantized separately on the, the linearized theory. So we'll impose this as a constraint in order to ensure that the solution corresponds to a good solution of the interacting theory. I just check me. You made it sound like it's sort of ad hoc, but isn't isn't it just that when you take this little kappa to zero limit, this is the result of the constraint? I mean, it reduces to this. Yeah, it reduces. Yeah, so if you you could essentially the it's not like an equation of motion in the linearized theory. These guys are basically unconstrained, but any solution of the nonlinear theory will result in something that satisfies this relation. That's the way to think of it, where these guys really are related to the local um, stress energy here. Yeah, one other thing just to mention, I might have skipped over this. Um, the, the only other thing that you have to worry about in the linearized theory are is um, the fact that this HAB does have this abelian gauge symmetry. So the, the way you deal with that is that you work with invariance under the abelian gauge transformations. So this is not more complicated in principle than constructing invariance like for a gauge field, like a, a um, like a, a, a Maxwell field, really. So it's just you have to work a little bit to construct things that are invariant under this linearized transformation. Okay. Doing pretty well for time today, actually. So <clears throat> Okay, so the next thing I want to talk about which came up briefly um, in response to Luca's question are um, the local versions of these constraints. So again, the context is we have this global Cauchy surface, and then we have a subregion that we're interested in and a complementary region, which we'll take to extend out to infinity. Um, and we're going to be interested in relating things inside will essentially have equations where we've split various modular Hamiltonians, et cetera, to their contributions coming only from one side. And we need to know the relation that the constraints, how they, the constraints uh, act locally for this kind of region. So this, this global constraint C was equal to the integral over the global Cauchy surface of this constraint equation of motion. And the idea is we just want to split this into the subregion part of that constraint plus the contribution for the complementary region. So here we have S, and then outside is S prime. So there's no problem in doing this in the classical theory because everything is you know, written just as local fields. Um, and so when we do this split, there are these identities that you most easily can get them from this higher wall uh, formalism that says what the integral of the constraint over a bounded subregion should look like. So we're going to focus on what this equation means. We're going to use that equation that roughly all follows from this equation that J is equal to this constraint up to this boundary term Q C. So when you integrate this constraint over the local region, you get a contribution from this boundary, another potential. This Q generally, when the, well, let me, yeah, let me just write it out. Um, right, so we're gonna use this equation. So the, the local constraints is we'll get the local contribution to the Hamiltonian just coming from the S region. And again, this is the matter and graviton Hamiltonian. 
And we'll think of the observer stress energy also being localized to this subregion as well. So we have this observer Hamiltonian as well is equal to this integral of the constraints plus the integral over the boundary of Q C. So in GR, when your vector field, this thing depends basically on derivatives of the vector field. Um, so yeah, I guess I can write that out. QC is minus one over 16 pi G, epsilon AB, del A, C, B. So again, when we have our vector field vanishing at the surface and that the, this thing, because this is equal to kappa times the binormal, you can work out that this is equal to minus one over eight pi G times kappa, just coming from that, times uh, the area element, say. We'll call this the area element. And so when this kappa is constant, this relation reduces to that the local observer, well, the local energy plus the observer Hamiltonian um, plus we'll say one over beta. So beta we've defined as two pi over kappa. This is the relation between sort of the inverse unroot temperature that we associate with something with surface gravity kappa, um, A over four G is the equal to this integral of the constraints. <clears throat> so in the quantum theory, we're going to be, when we split things into one-sided contributions, we'll have a local integral of matter and graviton stress tensor here. We'll have this observer Hamiltonian, which becomes an operator in the theory. And we have this ill-defined area term that's divergent, but notice also that this term is divergent. And we'll essentially be taking the expectation value of this equation in the quantum theory. So if the constraints are zero in expectation value in the quantum theory, it'll relate you know, the sum of these three operators, even though it involves two divergent things, will be zero in expectation values in the quantum theory. <clears throat> And so this is how you see that the divergence in this area term is going to be related to the divergence in the one-sided Hamiltonian, assuming this observer is a well-defined operator in the theory. Because again, this side is, you know, zero for physical Hilbert space. Okay, so this relation is also quite similar to, for example, like the first law of black hole mechanics. So it's an analog of that for these local subregions. So um, in the paper, we referred to this as the first law of local subregions. Really, it's you can take the very the first order variation of this equation, setting the right hand side to zero, and you would get a variation in the area, which you should be well. You should have in mind that this will eventually become a contribution to the entropy. The variation of the area is related to the variation of the observer energy and the local matter field energy. Um, <clears throat> wait, is it merely a matter of varying each term or because beta would also vary? Oh uh, yeah, you would keep beta fits. Uh, you you define this vector field to be to uh, yeah you, there's there's ways to set think this up so that you don't vary kappa is that so this reminds me of the old Bardeen Carter Hawking derivation of the first law from the SMAR formula but mm -hmm. there's a bunch of uh, soft shoe kind of messing around to, because when you vary that formula you get variations of quantities you don't want to vary in the first law, and then you have to solve uh -huh. for those variations. Are you saying that they could have also made the vector field metric dependent in such a way that 
Yeah, I believe so because um, the variation of kappa would have been zero and they would have immediately gotten the first slot. Uh, yeah, so it's a little easier when you have an actual killing vector background, um, I think. I can't, I'm trying to remember. So in like the, the walled and higher walled derivations, I think they showed even if you do have like a variation of kappa at first order, that that sort of drops out of the formula. So I'd have to check that. But then there's the things like this paper by Hollins and Wall for talking about something like stability of black holes and black brains. There they were thinking about second order variations. They had to be careful about these questions related to variations of kappa. Um, but they do set up this coordinate system where you can show that you can make it so it doesn't vary. Um, it's related to these Gaussian null coordinates. Um, and that also shows up in things like the holographic derivations of Einstein equations from entanglement. You're usually setting up a coordinate system where you can use these first law relations with kappa fixed. Um, so yeah. what, did, what did you say you called this relation in the box? I'm just... Oh, I just called, yeah, we call, I've been calling this the first law of local subregions, but it might not be. Yeah, I, would like, I, yeah. would like to, I would like to encourage you to call it the SMART formula for subregions. Okay, SMART formula. I shouldn't call it the SMART formula. And actually, let me also slow you down a little bit. If you're accelerating now to the point where I'm having okay. volume, so partly yeah, we can slow down because we're doing okay. Uh, just can you reiterate what the first term in that smart formula means? So it's the gravitation, it's the subregion piece of the Hamiltonian. But I mean, as an integral, are you merely integrating the constraints over that subregion, or what? What exactly is in H C S? -S? Um, first term in the box. Yeah. It's not just the constraints because, um, sorry, this term, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's you, it, the issue is with how you're treating the graviton piece, basically. Okay. Um, so this constraint, like if you do the perturbative expansion, you're going to get the second order piece is the, the second order part of the Einstein tensor here. And then there's sort of an overall boundary term that has to show up so that you ensure it's that you get this. So I think it's maybe easiest if you did an ABM composition and you would get some terms that kind of look like the second order piece of the Einstein tensor plus some other stuff that's related to how the lapse was chosen inside. Um, so yeah, I'm being a bit schematic just because I don't have those expressions off the top of my head. Um, but yeah, so there is this, in principle, there is this integral. I mean, it ends up being the sum of these two terms. Um, maybe an easier thing to say is it is just J. <laughs> okay. The thing that you're integrating is just J. Um, and so that is that is an explicit expression. So this thing is J, which you can construct from, you know, J was equal to theta on leak C. Minus the Lagrangian. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's the easier way to think of the vector. Um, and so, yeah, it does involve this this matter stress tensor showing up there. Yeah, uh, I guess maybe you can unmute and mask it. Yeah, you can unmute. <clears throat> Who is it? Was it Luke? Uh, Luke, yeah. Luke again? Well, maybe he's not. Okay. He's asking in affine time, kappa equals zero. Mm -hmm. What does that imply? That you cannot choose the affine time to do this analysis? Um. Yeah, I think what you're referring to is on a, a null surface. You can normalize the vector to be affinely parameterized. And that won't, that's not what you want to do because the, that vector will be non vanishing at the surface. So the one that vanishes at the surface is more like using the killing parameterization. So there'll be a roughly a exponential uh, relation between the affinely parameterized one and the 
the Killy parameterized one. And so that's the one you want to use because it, it vanishes at the surface here. Oh, so, so I was wondering mm -hmm. what would be like the the simplest like non-trivial background space time where I could kind of write down explicit formulas for all of these terms and kind of like clear up in my head like specifically what everything means. I see, yeah. Um it's expanding around Minkowski space would just get yeah, no no yeah you can expand around Minkowski space basically. Um and it, it so this is yeah, so the, the simplest setup is you should do a causal diamond in Minkowski space. Um, yeah, and then you can do this expansion there. So luckily there's several works of people thinking about that stuff. Uh, Ted has a couple papers on that. He's been interested in that. So yeah, just do a, a causal diamond in Minkowski space. Choose this vector to be the conformal killing vector that preserves it. Um, and you can get some explicit formulas for these various terms so that, yeah. yeah okay so the last thing to talk about is uh certain conditions for fixing the boundary So the philosophy is in the, the G Newton to zero limit. You can sort of pick arbitrary subregions in the background space time. And then sort of because DPOs are suppressed in this limit, you could just use the background to define subregions. Um, so that's true, but then you also have to worry about even these linearized DPOs of the graviton effectively are moving the boundary, which in, in situation in most situations, those linearized DPOs can affect things like. For example, the area of your surface. The only time the area won't be affected by that is if your surface is extremal, um, which is interesting, but we're, we're trying to consider more general subregions. So you have to think a little bit about how you're supposed to fix uh, the subregion. So even so, delta kappa C. Uh, so yeah, HAB equal Lie derivative of the background metric these transformations can affect things like the area. And so you have to worry a, a bit about fixing the, the location of the background sort of perturbatively in this expansion. So for this, we want to look at this local subregion Hamiltonian um, and propose a gauge a sort of a, a region fixing condition that relates to the expansion of that guy. So the subregion Hamiltonian, you can write it as kappa to the minus two times the background value again, plus kappa to the minus one times the linear, the perturbation that's linear in H plus kappa to the zero times this quadratic piece. And so this is the subregion one. So it's the contribution that we get just from integrating this local Hamiltonian in the sub the subregion. So this term is linear in the metric perturbation. And the idea is we're going to choose the boundary such that um, this first order contribution to the, Hamil the subregion Hamiltonian um, vanishes. So we're going to adjust the, this is gonna roughly be some bulk integral and then you're just gonna adjust the boundary so that this thing is set to zero. So, Let's just say, well, yeah, choose the boundary. The boundary of your subregion to set HC1 equal to zero. So um, you, I'm confused with the logic. Could I turn it around and say, choose any boundary you want, but then choose C so that that's true? Choose C so that's true. Or do I have to think of it? You know, what is this a geometrical condition on the boundary? Yeah, so you'll have some integral. This will be some bulk integral, and it's something that so in the case of a causal diamond um, that we just mentioned, this first order perturbation is the first order perturbation to the volume of the infilling spatial surface. 
And so what this is saying is adjust the boundary of the ball after you do perturbations to fix the volume of it. So fix the volume of the infilling part of the, the region. Um, that's an example. So, um, but at what stage am I doing this fixing? I think I've lost the thread here. Um, so far, you had been saying, oh, we divide up sigma into a region S and its complement. Um, then we get the SMAR formula. Um, and now you're saying, and, and we still have a residual linearized gauge symmetry of. Um, yeah. In this perturbative treatment. Mm -hmm. And now you're adding what exactly? You're telling me. So you can achieve this basically by by the transformations of this form. No, but it's not what does it mean to like achieve? Like why am I the formula in the box, the smart formula holds before you start restricting the boundary in any way, right? Yeah. So this just comes from that relation yeah, up there. Right. So I think it's like you're saying something that to my mind is a bit out of order. Like, why am I, I'm fixing this in preparation for doing something else? Or uh, why do I have to fix it? Uh, um, so, yeah, it's just that you do have to specify. I think what it comes down to ultimately is when you're careful about, say, the quantization of the gravitons, there's you're going to have various boundary conditions for the subregion of this form. And that can affect sort of whether your Hamiltonian's generating the, the flow that you think it's generating on the, the algebra, um, just because you have to be careful. So these are like linearized diffios that are acting on the boundary. So this is just saying, how are you treating the edge mode contribution to the algebra for the gravitons is what it's coming down to. So I'm going to give a set of uh, conditions. Well, I'm going to say this condition is something so that it'll ultimately it'll make sure that there's sort of the perturbations in the area are order G Newton, so order kappa squared, which are going to be important for since we're considering this perturbative treatment. And ultimately, we have in mind setting G Newton to zero. And so we're going to be doing perturbations of the area that such that A over 4G, delta A over 4G is finite. But it, it just comes down to how you're treating roughly the, the edge mode piece of the gravitons. I guess I'll ask more later. When you okay. Finish. So as I mentioned, this is something that you can achieve with one of these linearized DPOs that's localized um, it just has a non-trivial contribution at the boundary. So can achieve with a linearized if you. Um, the second point is this holds automatically. or perturbations of killing horizons. So this, this condition that the first order contribution to the Hamiltonian is just identically true when you're perturbing around a killing horizon. And so it's, and it's essentially where the first law of black hole mechanics, you use this fact there's sort of no term like this in the first law. You really have, okay, sorry, I'm using this, but the analogous formula when you're outside of a black hole is a relation between the Hamilton, the ADM Hamiltonian and the area the term of the black hole. There's not a term like this, and it's because the first order perturbation automatically vanishes when you perturb around killing horizons. Um, and so we're just saying, um, that this is also available for these arbitrary surfaces. You just have to choose the surface such that this equation holds. And as I, as I alluded to before, this in the case of a causal diamond, this is really a, a fixed volume constraint for causal diamonds.
Uh, <laughs> space. In or maximally symmetric spaces. <laughs> yes. So maximally symmetric. So really, if you're perturbing around flat space or you know ADS or DS, and you're looking at causal diamonds, this condition is the condition that you want to fix the volume at first order in perturbation. So you adjust the radius of the ball so that the volume, the infilling volume is fixed. Um, I want to leave this up here. So if you do this constraint at first order, what it now reduces to is we set the first order piece here, we're setting to zero by fix, adjusting the boundary. So what's left over in this equation when you do this perturbation to first order, um, essentially you say, okay, it says that, so if we expand the observer Hamiltonian, say that you give it some order one over kappa piece, We'll call that the minus one contribution contribution to the observer Hamiltonian, um, plus basically the well, it has to equal. And now I'm going to use two different values of okay, one over kappa times uh, minus four. Sorry for the notation. So <laughs> let me just explain. This is the surface gravity. This is this funny uh, parameter. So basically, it relates to the, the large contribution to the observer Hamiltonian, the thing that would, this whole piece would be divergent if you set kappa to zero, to the first order piece perturbation of the area. So this is just the value that the area takes using linearized graviton perturbations. Um, and because the area term shows up in this relation with this is a order kappa to the minus two is this where one over G is kappa to the minus two. So the first order perturbation in the area gets enhanced by dividing by this. So what it says is that this contribution is related to the area, but since we're going to be thinking about the observer Hamiltonian having sort of only order kappa to the zero fluctuations, if we set this to zero, it just says the area fixed at order kappa to the one. So it's just saying this term is also going to be set to zero from this constraint. And so what you're left with is only a second order perturbation to the area, which will give a finite contribution to this equation. I should say you're you know, out of nominal time. OK, I think we're basically, yeah, this was sort of the last important point. Let me just. Oh yeah, I wanted to mention why this is this consideration is important. Um, in the in one of the Witten, uh, the paper by Chandra Sakari and Pennington and Witten on large N algebras that kind of related to black hole stuff, um, they talk about different choices of ensembles or black holes and things, um, and they specifically focus on what they call the microcanonical ensemble, which roughly translates to this kind of condition that you only allow order one as opposed to order one over kappa fluctuations in something like an observer Hamiltonian. If you do this on the complementary region, it's the same condition on the fluctuations in the ADM Hamiltonian. So I just wanted to point out this is related to the micro canonical ensemble. in the CPW paper. And just to remind you which one that is, that's this 2209.10.4.5. And so in our constructions, we're going to be basically in that same context where we're doing this microcanonical ensemble. And so finally, there are additional conditions that you should think about how to treat this at the next order as well. Um, we sort of described a few of these in this paper that I posted, well, the paper on the course materials that I wrote. Um, and so there's some interesting questions there about how you're supposed to treat the, the procedure for fixing the boundary um, there. Okay, so 
that's basically what I wanted to say about the classical constraints going forward. The next time we're going to talk about how you're supposed to implement these in the quantum theory and then start relating it to the construction of algebras. So we can stop there and take, take more questions. Great. I have a question. Okay. <laughs> um, coming back again to what's going on with this extra condition on the surface. Mm -hmm. Is it okay to think of this as um, we start with the phase space of the full theory, then we define some subregion, mm -hmm. and we kind of want to talk about the phase space of the subregion. Um, and so, what's going on here when you impose this extra restriction is you're basically narrowing down what phase space. Yeah, so if you didn't have this constraints, you would work, you're kind of talking about, you're essentially describing for fixed sort of solution, you're defining many different subregions if you don't kind of fix this condition. Does that make sense? Um, uh, uh, in a backwards way, but I'm yeah. just saying it in a forwards way. Okay. <laughs> so like the goal, so because we're gonna eventually wanna talk about quantum mechanics, and mm -hmm. with it, which would have like the Hilbert space and algebra observables on it. Yeah. But we're going to get that Hilbert space by quantizing a classical system. Yeah. And and so first we have to define what's the phase space that we're quantizing. And sure. Yeah. And uh, so this extra condition is like refining or restricting the definition of what phase space we want to be talking about. Is that a valid way to look at what you're? Well. I think we're always going to be in the perspective that you're quantizing the global space and then it's sort of actually telling you how to fix an algebra in that. So in principle, you quantize the global phase space and then this is telling you how you're supposed to fix the algebra for the subregion in the phase space. We're going to get to it from a sort of mixture of, of steps where we say we've sort of gauge fixed the classical theory up to basically you know, uh, we gauge fix most of the transformation so that you're left with operators inside and then operators outside. And then there's going to be a residual constraint coming from the fact that the gauge fixing can't be purely local. Um, but yeah, I would say in the global theory, it's really, you should think of it as defining an algebra for the subregion, um, as opposed, you know, I don't, does that, <laughs> um at the quantum level yeah but yeah. i guess i are you telling me i can't proceed first through the classical thing fully and then quantize when i'm done i have to sort of to get to meaningfully interpret what you mean by this constraint on the on the boundary of the region i have to formulate it in the quantum context that sounds a little fishy um like maybe i, I will classical algebra i could yeah, I would say there's a classical algebra as well. And then you implement the, well, yeah, we should. So basically you would implement, it's not this constraint, but that global constraint that we wrote down mm -hmm. on that classical al algebra of observables in order to say how this um, theory basically uh, implements all the constraints classically as well. And so you would have to construct things that commute with that global constraint operator. And it's just the things that are purely localized look like they transform under that constraint because um, I erased it, but there's sort of this two-sided Hamiltonian is generating a time translation for those fields in your classical algebra. I guess I'll comment the something that I've commented to both of you separately. Okay. Uh, which is that if if you don't include this uh, condition that the subregion can move dynamically, uh, for example, under linear as diffeomorphisms, you won't get any observables even classically in the subregion. So to define the classical algebra of observables associated with the subregion, this condition is is necessary because otherwise they won't be gauge invariant. Uh... Yeah, I mean, you have to think a bit about how much gauge fixing you've done relative to essentially, yeah, you're, you want to make sure that you you gauge fixed transformations that move the subregion around. So yeah, maybe you can say it is 
if you're not careful about this, you might get things that are transforming under diffios that are moving your subregion. So they're not gauge invariant. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, I guess my discomfort is that we're sort of mixing mathematical um, constraints that seem convenient to us with physical ideas. And I don't see exactly where the border is or how to physicalize the mathematics fully. Like you use the word observer, for example, it's something we introduce to define the region. And but we do have a physical idea of what that observer piece of the Hamiltonian could represent as a like a, an isolated part of the subsystem that's effectively decoupled. Yeah. But so, but now I would want the same kind of physical status for this other condition that we seem to be injecting before we can talk about observables. Um, yet it just appeared on a purely mathematical footing. Um, I don't know if I'm being clear enough or even thinking clearly enough to be asking something sharp, but. Okay. Does that yeah, I would worry that you would sort of have, you wouldn't, you would sort of overcount the number of degrees of freedom in the algebra. So you're trying to do this picture where you're working around the background and then parameterizing your global algebra in terms of stuff for the subregion and stuff for the complementary region. You could worry that you're somehow overcounting if you don't fix these types of transformations that move the, the subregion. And so this is like, yeah, sort of an edge mode type picture where you sort of have a different copy for every subregion, but it, it might overcount in the in the global picture. Um, um, well, but the way you put it that way, it sounds like all you're doing is making a last step of reducing the phase space to take out the gauge freedom. But it doesn't sound like it's just that because fixing a volume, the volume is presumably like a gauge invariant quantity in some sense. So it looks like well, the, we, the volume's not gauge invariant unless they tell you what the boundary is. Right. So, right. So, <laughs> I mean, having yeah. fixed it, uh, can the observer measure the volume and say, I'm asking physical questions about a region with a certain observer with a certain volume? Um, let me ask it differently. I keep wanting to think of it like in quantum mechanics where you could have, you can decompose a Hilbert space into subspaces that are eigenspaces of some operator. You'd say, okay, I'm just gonna ask a question about one of those eigen subspaces. And that's like a well-defined way to focus in on a subspace of Hilbert space and ask physical questions. But is this of the exact same status? Can I say there's like a volume operator for my subregion, and I could consider all the quantum states with different volumes, and I want to ask about subspace with one given volume? Or is it just that's a wrong way to think about what you're doing? I mean, yeah, you might be able to phrase it like that, and then that subspace is sort of a sub is corresponding to a sub the sub algebra that you're actually talking about for the region of space time. So yeah, it just comes down to what exactly you mean by drawing this region in space time, talking about the operators in that region. Um, for example, the way you phrased it, there could be surfaces with different volumes that you know in some gauge map to that same the same coordinate location that you drew. And so we're trying to just eliminate that uh, redundancy there, that there's your principle defining algebras from what you would assume in a, in a fixed background are different subregions. So I mean, there could be different ways to do it as well. It's just, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Things. That's what I want to tell you. So, yeah, I think you have to do something like the main thing is when you, you have this relation like this, 
you do want to, at the end of the day, make sure you're getting entropies that are finite. And so it seems like you need to do something so this first order piece of the area drops out. Um, and you will also, assuming that you want small observer excitations, it kind of fixes, say, if you want this and this to be, to basically be zero at first order, you're going to get something like this constraint on this. So I think technically it is the algebras would look a little funny if you didn't have something like this as well. Suppose, could I, instead of fixing the volume, could I fix, let's say, the integral of the Ricci scalar of, of, this, of S over the region? Yeah, so you, then you would have to ask, how does that affect actually what this operator is? Because I think that it'll be different if you have different prescriptions. Um, and then you want to check that these relations are, everything's kind of order one there. So do you think it's plausible that it is, or is there something very special about the volume and keeping a- I mean, there is something special in that you can identify what this is like, for example, if you do perturbations of a, a causal diamond in flat space, you do see that the volume shows up for the profile of the vector field that you picked. Um, but it could be there's different choices there. It seems like it does have to be related to the, the Hamiltonian, though, at least from this perspective. Um. One thing is that I don't think you're fixing the volume in general. The, the condition that you've written down is just fixing the area. The volume is only for maximally symmetric space times, right? Yeah, that's so, correct. So it, I think that this, depending on what this vector field looks like and the thing in the background, I, I'm not I'm not convinced that it would always be the volume. Yeah. And and the area fixing is only even a partial fixing of the subregion to actually fix describe how the the um, in a general background how the uh, location of the subregion depends on variations. You have to do a lot more work than just saying that the area is fixed. Yeah, it's definitely not a complete fixing. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you can easily work out even in the causal diamond if I just say the area is fixed, it's easy to just pick a wiggly perturbation of the surface that fixes the area, but you know, in a fixed background, it looks like it gives a different region. And so there's, in principle, other conditions on top of this one. We're just saying that this one seems important for getting, you know, finite values for the entropy differences at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. uh, on that on that topic, someone in the chat has asked if the choice of observer observer fixes the choice of subregion where the algebra lives. Uh, yeah, you'd have, I guess, yeah, you'd have to say what's the detailed model. I mean, one thing you would imagine doing is to actually do a world line, and then you would say it's, you know, we're going to do a finite amount of time. So that's another way that you could say, if, if that's how you defined the subregion, that would fix the, the boundary. I mean, maybe that would be a good exercise to, or thing to, to work out is how that condition translates to the ones that we're, we're proposing here. So you have a fixed time you know, that in principle is a different condition, and then you can <laughs> work out what those gauge fixing conditions are. That condition being the time, the proper time? Yeah, say you define it as a proper time interval for a world line, then draw the light cones and see what that implies for various things here. It also, I mean, you still have to pick this vector field and go through an analysis thing. Um, is there a relation to the fact that in the quantum theory, the area is in the center of both the algebra of S and its commutant and in the complementary region. Like, could you take uh, the point that, of course, I should fix the area because it's well, in the center, so I can fix it. And that's the well, space interpretation I want. Okay, there's a question is in, in the quantum theory, is it in the center? It kind of looks like it, but on the other hand, it's you know, take it literally in the standard setup, it's it's singular as an operator. So um, it wants to be in the center. It looks like it should be in the center, but that might be a classical statement, basically. Um, so you can kind of work with these operators localized on co-dimension two surfaces in the classical theory. Mm -hmm. It seemed to be more problematic in sort of a quantum field theory description. Um, but say, yeah, okay, say it was morally central. 
you're saying is does that mean yeah so in principle i think yeah yeah, it means you could simultaneously you can it's, decompose the Hilbert space into its eigenspace. Yeah, I should say that you should look. There is some discussion of this idea in this uh, CPW paper here, where they talk about the uh, this issue of the area being classically central, um, and that when you smear it, you really can't be working with just the area. You should really be working at with sort of the sum of this one-sided Hamiltonian in the area, and that effectively all of the good operators, since that it always involves some other contribution here, um, it, it destroys the actual property of being central. And so, yeah, that's why I'm saying maybe don't just say that it's central in the classical theory or the quantum theory. Um, there might be a way to make sense of that in terms of a sort of a cutoff description instead of this continuum description that we've been developing. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I think it's probably possible to do this even cases where the area is not fixed. I, I mean, they discuss the how to do this if the observer Hamiltonian is large, uh, if, if this piece on the left-hand side is large in some cases. But I don't think, it doesn't seem yeah, like there's any general reason why dressing should should have to require that the area be fixed. Yeah, you just have to worry about, you know, if the entropies, if the, you know, if you take two states on whatever algebra you pick and the entropies are divergent, um, it complicates the the interpretation a little bit in terms of, say, a nice, you know, one of these factors that we were working with. You might have to be a bit careful about how the actual algebraic description works there. Um, Anyone else? Okay. Okay, yep. Yeah. So thanks. We'll see everyone on Wednesday.